So now we sit where we sit still. Mm -hmm. And so our past is our present, is our future. Mm -hmm. If it looks like this today, then it might look like this still in 20 years. Mm -hmm. time. And that's why when some people tell me things are getting better, then I say, what? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> Where? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, the information must be understood within its context, and at the same time, it's a product of the previous centuries. And so, we'll just simply replace certain aspects of the development of Christianity. Basically, what you're just looking at is the ge geographical, social, economic, political, and intellectual analysis developed most of the during the 16th century. The dawn of the 16th century. Okay. Right? Yeah. So that all acts as a backdrop, and you'll see now how it quite changes because, first of all, you have an age of discovery. The Portuguese and the Spanish are brilliant at um, maritime. They're getting their ships together to discover the, the real world because then I suddenly decided the world is not flat anymore. <laughs> So, well, there's some people that think it's flat. Yeah, there's still some people who think it's flat. Yeah, the flat world theory. Oh my goodness. That's <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> You've seen this thing. So, they discover a, a world much more vast than most had dreamed of. You have Bottom and Dias, who comes around the Cape of Gouda, Vasco de Gama, who discovers India, spices, the spice route. Hmm. Now we have one on Route 44. You have Columbus who discovers the West Indies. Cabral Brazil for the Portuguese in the 1500. And then, very important during this time, you have Luther who invaded John Eck at Leipzig in 1519. Then Magellan begins the first voyage around the world. Around the world. <laughs> um, you also have the geographical expansion and colonization by Spain. Not that colonization has not ended, it has continued to this day, simply in the form of companies. Uh, <laughs> 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 like, like, like the one who we see, um, nothing has changed, just the form. Uh, Portugal, England, France, and Holland does the same, they follow suit. You have the invention of the telescope, gunpowder, and the most important of all is the printing press. And the printing press. Yeah. Luther says... That's what yeah. pushed Luther up. <laughs> printing is God's latest and best work. <laughs> best print the true religion around the world. I mean, now we have the internet, but the internet also creates havoc. We have social media that can also create okay. havoc okay. at the same time that yeah. used improperly. Um, yeah, you got to seriously pray. You have the first book printed, the Latin Bible. In Gutenberg in 1456. Now you have the age of transition and years where things change just completely in Europe. Um, with the printing press, you also then have maps of the new world. Hmm. Uh, the problem in Europe is the feudal system. Okay, you know what the feudal system is? Basically, a, a system no. of governance where your church, maybe the, the, in this case the Roman Catholic Church, and then your um, lords who owned vast stretches of land. Okay. Um, and so the rest of the people was workers and they were working on these farms uh, and living on these okay. farms. Okay. However, what happens is you also have the crusades happening during that time. Almost like capitalism, sure. early yeah. capitalism. I'm sure you see, see there's, there's, there's been some uh, Netflix has had a lot of series and there was one of the crusades. Yeah, but some time they have really? Years so there's actually there's, there's, there's a series out yeah. of the crusade, that'd be interesting. Yeah. <coughs> so and this feudal system is now starting to crumble because what happens is after the crusades a lot of survivors survivors refuse to return to the farms. Hmm. I think some of them enriched themselves by the way on that side too and came back with even gold in their pockets too, hmm. it seems. There's new towns and cities that's jumping up everywhere simply because there's coal, iron, and solar, which is now being produced and providing jobs and money. Minerals. But even worse, the bartering economy, goods for goods, is now changing. Uh, you now have cash for goods yeah. and services. Yeah. And today it's even worse. There's not even goods. 
they just start going and so forth and so forth. Your yeah, money's become annual. Yeah, you, you have virtual money now which doesn't exist because banks print money no longer on governments. Um, they say it's government, I don't think so. Because if the bank can move transactions all the time, then where is that money coming from? Because the amounts that they have is larger than the sums of money that's being printed. Yeah, that's, the, that's their problem. Sorry. They've got more money than gold. Yes. <laughs> that kind of like... So uh, it hasn't changed. Yeah. But here's the problem now. The Roman church and the nobility sits with their vast lands, but nobody looked to look after it. So what do they do? They resort to questionable tactics. The Lord denies the traditional hunting and fishing rights to peasants. The church provide, uh, 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 starts what we call the sale of offices and indulgences. Now, sale of offices would have been like uh, pieces of wood from the cross. I don't know how they got hold of it. Or piece of rope or from the Jesus. Uh, oh, to okay, okay, that okay, of nonsense. Okay. Indulgences were simply where they literally gave you a certificate and you paid them an amount. And that certificate secured your entrance into heaven. Yes, yes, I know about that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Then you had the bishops and priests who was even worse. <coughs> And this, well, look, if it's, if it's bad at the top, then it will, it will filter down. So now at the bottom, you have bishops and priests who is enforcing a death diet. Yeah. Not that the worker is not due his wage, but what they did was, they asked, every time they, they, they paid somebody, they had a right or claim on either your cow or your whole uh, 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 um, chicken run, so they could literally take away what food you had in an instant and they would make you poor, <laughs> reduce you to nothing. And obviously, as we, we all do, the peasants at the bottom will always revolt. <laughs> at some stage they revolt. So they leave the manners for towns with the help of guilds or trade unions. Can you imagine we had trade unions already in the 15th, 16th century? Uh, they became artisans and they also took up arms in an attempt to claim their own by force. And then you have the idea of nationalism that suddenly jumps up also. This is where art yes. and church also took their split. Yes. Well, <coughs> the funny thing is if you go back right to Constantine, that's your church and art met already. Met, met, Constantine yeah. was both the head of the pagan church. And, and the church. The, the church, yeah. And so what he did was for syncretism. Yes. And nobody, and that's when monasticism followed, you see. That's when people got unhappy with what they did what? decide. But nobody fully grasped exactly what Constantine was busy doing. Well, some say he was a Christian, others say, yes. no, I can't believe that. <laughs> well, he stopped persecution at least. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, he did. But um, I mean, but then what <laughs> is that it? Yeah, but then what follows is worse because he exactly. takes a lot of what is pagan and he brings it into the traditional church. Yeah, that's where Easter and then Easter you, Easter you, popped up. Then you start having your basilicas and start being built. And that's how the Roman mm. Catholic Church develops from there. Yeah. <laughs> then by 1942, the last of the Barbadan killers or rulers is driven out of Spain. Um, it's funny how, 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 how history does actually repeat itself. Hmm. Do you know Muslims are in Europe? Especially Spain, France, Oh yeah, no, no. it's a big problem in Europe at the yes. moment. A big problem there. So they never really been driven out. Maybe the rulers were driven out, yeah. You have the Inquisition who consolidates his claims by eliminating the Jewish and Muslim influence. So yeah, hmm. within the church and the country. Spain rapidly becoming the most powerful, the most Catholic nation of Europe. You have France and England, they too have a strong national consciousness. Germany and Italy follows after that. Um, Germany born in Italy. You have the Pope, the ruler of the Papal States, the most powerful lord in Italy. And they still own the land. It hasn't changed. Talk to they don't necessarily own the whole of Italy, but they own um, the vast amount of land that they own across the world is mm. a, a 
it's incredible, it's, it's huge, what they control and what they own. In Germany, you have the spirit of nationalism again. Um, now, very important, lose the success to some extent it can be attributed to the fact that he successfully appealed to this rising tide of nationalism. So nationalism in each of these countries became more sharply defined in the relationship to Rome. If you look at Spain, anti-papal, but Catholic. So they don't really break the tides mm. of, 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 the, of the theology. Mm. The theology remains. Mm. They become anti-papal because they don't like what necessarily happened there. Yes. But they retain the theology. They still hold on to the theology. That's the problem, because all theology was wrong. France <coughs> is the outfit for anti-talent fever, which drove it to attempt to control the paper center of the church again. So, instead of but growing, they still attempt to, to move in and, and see if they can't change it from within. Uh, where the space is not, let's pull out. Mm. We'll retain the theology, but we don't want to do it. Mm. Uh, we don't need you to do it yet. Mm. That's basically all they're saying. England, I think they hate everybody, not just. <laughs> England now got with a resentment against the Roman Church, and this compels the English to follow a separate course. Because you have the England, English Reformation stands on its own again, mm. and follows um, a little bit later. Again, they retain the Roman little liturgy and theology, because you have what we call um, the Anglican Church in England. Mm. You get both the High Anglican and the Low okay. Anglican. The I didn't know that. Yeah, the Low Anglican will be the St. James Church in. In Germany, although normally Roman Catholic, here you have a, a mixture of devotion and paganism again. Mm. Uh, but Germany was destined to produce both its boldness and antagonist Martin Luther and his staunch, staunchest defender John Eck. Uh, that's how the two of them got into their little debate. Mm. Then eventually you have what we call the Renaissance. It was a revival of learning. Both of the side effects of the Crusades, you have the, or at least the side effects of the Crusades, brings with it Arabic mathematics, medicine, architecture, astronomy. So you see what happens during this Crusades. It's a funny thing that during all of that, that this is brought across. Remember, they get rid of the caliphs, the yeah. Mohammedan rulers, but that's what they leave behind. Uh, they leave the mathematics behind. They, 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 they the still leave the. But isn't that the problem them. Israel had? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so they leave all of this behind. They leave some good stuff behind. Um, how do you think those guys found the star of Bethlehem? I mean, just like it. <laughs> <laughs> they were good at it. Yeah, they were. And then there's also the rediscovery of the Greek philosophers and poets, which introduced intellectual activity. And this is said again, there was this, there, this is also the start of the age of what we call the age of reason. Mm -hmm. You have Lombard and Salam, Aquinas, Avalon, Occam, all attempted to use the Renaissance philosophy period as well. to undergo traditional Roman Catholic beliefs. Um, yeah, that's the problem with philosophy. Eh? We try and um, undergird a lot of our actual beliefs with philosophy our own beliefs, not necessarily in this case the Roman Catholic beliefs, but our own beliefs sometimes. Mm -hmm. We are pretty good at finding reasons for what we believe. Um, the resulting fusion is known as what we call scholasticism. This intellectual activity in defense of the faith is, was fostered by the universities, which began, which began to spring up in the 12th and 13th century all over Europe. This is all prior to, to the Reformation. The Renaissance also brings to life the artistic and literary interests in the medieval man. So you see, it was much more than just the Reformation. There was a lot of that, lots happening during this particular time. The Pope himself became patrons of the Renaissance. Nicholas IV founded the Vatican Library and he fostered learning by patronage. Uh, and then you have the opposite end, which is Leo X, 
whose main thesis was to revive paganism. Uh, the Renaissance humanism centered early in Italy, and there you see another facet that coming through: humanism, mm. human rights. Mm. So yeah, there's a lot happening during this time. Yeah. Um, Northern Europe, you have a fusion of humanism and mysticism, or the devotion of Moderna, and then you have like uh, classics developed from that, such as the German theology and the imitation of Christ, as well as similar monastic movements. You still have the brethren today, but not in the same form as you had then. Uh, <coughs> a number of scholars breathed the spirit who in turn would help prepare the way for the Reformation of Brooklyn. 1455, published the, uh, to 1522, published the first Hebrew grammar in an attempt to stimulate a more serious study of the Old Testament. So now we're looking at the church itself. And then you have Colette. Oxford professor whose lectures on Paul's epistles stimulated Erasmus. Mm. So now they starting to get into the word. Mm. This is what they wanted in the church, and this is where we build up towards mm. Mr. Luther. Erasmus gave life to the study of scripture and the reform of the church, Roman Catholic to be specific. But what happens to Erasmus is he believes that he, he must not leave the church. He must stay in the church. If reform is to come, then it must be done from the inside and not the outside, mm. as Luther eventually does. Mm. You see, he has to withdraw eventually. Yeah. In fact, they would kick him out after all of what he does and when he pins all his 97. <laughs> so he personifies the Northern Renaissance, and as such, may be considered the John of Baptist, the Baptist of the Reformation. There's always a forerunner. Always somebody who is a catalyst to what is to, to eventually come. <coughs> Ultimately, Europe on the eve, that's the next section, the religious facade, on the eve of the Reformation was just as religious as it had been for over a thousand years. And what is really different from, from, from what we see here? Is it any different today? The churches and holy shrines everywhere. Go into it, go to the meet for Sermonies hate the church, love the church. Hmm. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm. Hate the church. Hate it for what it has become. Yes. But love it for what it is. Love it because it belongs to God. Yeah. It belongs to Jesus. He is the head of the church. Yeah. So there will always be the church within the church. Yeah. And never forget that. Yeah. So there might be a thousand of us sitting, but there might only be a, a, a hundred saved. Oh, scary really thought. So it is a scary thought. Um, <coughs> but that's what's <coughs> that's just what it is today. Sure. You first of all you have the what we call the great Petrobusians of under Peter the Brace and the Henrichians under Henry of Lausanne, who opposed the idolatrous nature of saint and image worship. So you track the day to in, in your church, in the life of your church, track if there is any form of idolatrous worship. It's simple sometimes in that um, this is one guy shares his testimony, he says this in itself may be seen as an attempt at reforming the church, however monasteries, monasteries and convents frequently became corrupt. Of. You have your spiritual Franciscans and schismatic orders which said similarly desires that is to recover the vision and zeal of the founders. The problem is the corruption just continued. Mm. <clears throat> Men trying to, to fix what they themselves couldn't fix, their own hearts. Mm. Because they never understood it to be a matter of the heart mm. and their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's still this groundswell, there's still this, this, this misunderstanding of the word. The papers itself, long regarded as both infallible and impeccable by the faithful, abundantly demonstrated that it was neither. In 904 to 1962, you have what we call pedocracy. Um, yeah, they had the, for, what's it, 58 years, they had prostitutes visiting the... Okay, so Erasmus was after Wycliffe. Uh, yeah. Yep, after um, Wycliffe. Okay. 
I remember Wakefield from Bruce, so I was trying to. I was still going to do him, or is Erasmus after him? After. Did you have the Babylonian captivity? That simply they moved the headquarters to Avignon, and then eventually it was moved back again. You have the papal schism between. Uh, that must be 1378 to 1439. Uh, during this particular time, they had up to three popes. So there wasn't a, a singular one ruling <coughs> in the papacy. <coughs> there was two to three different popes being chosen at different places and ruling at the same time. Yes. Then you have the conciliators. Which is weird because now there's three gods. <laughs> 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 Some of the uh, um, directors actually claim that, yeah, like you say, they speak, it's God speaking, so yeah. they speak God speaking at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, problem. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Consider succeeded partially by the use of general councils. What they did succeed in, though, was to end the papal schism at the Council of Constance. So eventually you have one pope again. But what they failed to do was to alter the moral degradation <coughs> of the clergy. What I'm doing is shortening your notes. Uh, I'm just letting out what I think should be said. Hmm. We'll see how it's not the economy or all of that stuff. You might still read it at all. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just making it. The burning of John Luce, 1450, <coughs> and Jerome of Prague for heresy. Of Prague for heresy. And here they demonstrated how utterly the additional conservatives attempted to reform actually was. So the traditionalists who was trying to, to sort out the bottom of their accreditation are themselves guilty of sending men to the stake and burning them alive. And then in 1384 you find out Whitecliffe or John Whitecliffe hmm. he comes a reform at the age of 46 who firmly believes that Christ is the only head of the church. Now he has an end in his Bible. And if Christ is the only head of the church, then the Pope must be the Antichrist. So now he's applying logic. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> the church is made up of elect and only known to God. And like I said, hate the church for what it has become, but love the church, because the actual church belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he knows who they are, who is sheep. Oh. Therefore, the Roman Church is not the true Church. He denied the bodily presence of Christ in the Mass. So you see, here already there's a change in the thinking regarding mm -hmm. the, 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 the sacraments. So here already there's the change is starting to come in, uh, mm -hmm. in small little uh, in the administrations of the Church. The Bible alone provides the authority for the Christian and the Church. Remember the, the, the cry of the Reformation was sola scriptura. Yeah, already the foundation is being laid. Yeah. Then you have the followers of, of, of Wycliffe, which were called the Lollards, and they provide the link between Wycliffe and the Reformation in England, which we will discuss in that lesson. Hmm. You have John Hus, who died in 1415. He's of the, he was born in, he, he's originally from Bohemia and he becomes Michael's most famous disciple. But more an evangelist. Yeah, right. Yes, he was uh, his disciple. He is the evangelist. Yes. His, his followers is Moravian Brethren or the Trinity Unity of the Brethren. And they still survive to the present day. <laughs> yes. They still survive yeah. to the present day. Like the Consolidus, he Erasmus, and now we move to Erasmus, he envisioned the reform of the Roman Catholic Church from within. Um, you still have this today sometimes, and that is why I must be careful. When I went to college, the first, one of the first questions in my interview was, how would you know someone, if you were walking down the road, and you were coming towards me, how would I know if you were a Christian? And eventually I answered after a minute. That's a tough so, question. Uh, after a minute or so I said, I wouldn't. And then we went up. You will no. No. Because who witnesses that you are a Christian? The Spirit first. Yeah. Not another man by your actions. The yeah. Spirit witnesses first. Yes. So I wouldn't know that. So 
And there's sometimes some people within churches that we may call cultic uh, or cults, cultic cults, um, who try and remain within the churches and actually try to reform within the, their theology or the wrong thinking. So one must be careful to yeah, say yeah, somebody is yeah. not a Christian. Yeah, yeah. So he didn't accept the structure or dogma, but he utilized the canon law of the fathers like Jerome and Augustine and the Bible to call the church back to its apostolic vision of life. He was primarily a writer, so he launched his reform through the pen and the print shop. <laughs> and he, he writes his first book, The Dagger of the Christian Soldier. And what he does is he needs to pro propagate the primacy of the scriptures, like his predecessors, Wycliffe and Lewis. Above all the scriptures speak of Christ, and it is to Christ to whom one must long and seek to imitate. You then have the first Greek New Testament in 1516, which is based upon the four best, best Greek manuscripts available in these days, obviously. Remember, we have much more manuscripts now. Yeah, yeah. Which was the manuscript again that he had? Or that was available to him? It's not going to be part of any test. Okay. The basis for numerous editions of the Bible, including the King James Version of 1611, mm -hmm. which some today still believe is the only true Bible, but that is debatable. Yeah. The Reformation did not come through the pen of Erasmus or Christian humanism. Mm. His humanist assumption, and here's where he goes wrong, if only man knew better, he would do better. In, and he doesn't take seriously man's self, sinful nature and his desperate need of God's grace. Uh, as Lindsay uh, in, his, in, his, uh, in his book writes, and it reminds us, humanism has supplied the superfluity of teachers the times needed a prophet, they received one, a man of the people, bone of their bone and flesh of their flesh. One who himself had lived a popular religious life with all the thoroughness of a strong, earnest nature, who had sounded all his depths and tested his capacities, and gave in the end no relief for his burdened conscience, who at last had found his way into the presence of God, and who knew by his own personal experience that the living God was accessible to every Christian. He had won the freedom of a Christian man and had reached through faith a joy in living far deeper than that which our humanism boasted. That's the end of the first lesson. This is maybe the history of Luther. So we will not stay too long in him. Luther the monk. I said, one plants and one waters, undoubtedly the times were right. The Roman Catholic Church was in desperate need of reform. One plants, meaning Michael Pus and Erasmus, mm. one waters, Luther. Luther. Mm. And that is why one must not never take things out of its context, try and find the full story. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot said around Luther, but a lot of people forget about the foundations that was laid before Luther. Like with Samuel, God had prepared the way for his man, in this case, Luther. I mean, a lot of the ground died <laughs> for Luther, let's be honest. Samuel is born at the right time, yeah. so is Luther. Yeah. Well, how does it say in the New Testament? At the right time, he said. At the appointed time. He said, oh. Opinion is very on this matter. Some interpreters of the Reformation consider it a phenomenon which is a result of converging and conflicting economic, political and social factors. However, others look at it as a result of the personal psychological problems within the complex personality of Luther. Because if we look at his history and how he struggled, we'll begin to understand his theology eventually. The less than superficial frivolous approaches to the Reformation promote neither understanding nor appreciation for what was undoubtedly a very complex but also very profound religious movement. So we'll attempt to follow the course of the Reformation as it developed in Germany specifically. Hmm. In this case, in the spiritual privilege of the Augustinian monk, Martin Luther. This approach seeks into justice with the basic religious driving forces of this powerful movement without ignoring the 16th century world with its complex and confusing realities. 
is born in Eisleben, in Germany, in the mining center, in 1483. Father was Hans Luther, mother Margarita. Very poor people, but eventually his father becomes a manager in 1491 of Furnaces, and he also becomes a member of the Men's Food Civic Council, so things that goes a little bit better. Mm. And he's also been actually, obviously his father now could afford him to send him to school. Um, unlike our schools, it's hard work and stern discipline. <laughs> Luther attended Latin schools in Mansfield, Magdeburg, and Eisenach. Then in 1501, he starts his university training and achieves his Bachelor of Arts. He then follows it up with a Bachelor in Law, Bachelor of Master's Degree in Law, which he completes in 1505. However, he is done and it takes a turn. He forsakes his studies and he takes up the life of a monk. And on July 17 of that same year, Luther enters the Augustinian monastery at Erfurt. And here's what leads to this decision. Uh, in a very short space of time, there's two friends who dies, one very violently. Luther himself nearly bleeds to death. Uh, the scabbard mm -hmm. is broken at the end, so the sword pierces through the end and cuts an artery, so he nearly bleeds to death. Then on his way from Erfurt to Stottenheim, he's struck down by lightning, and while laying on the ground, he's pleading to, 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 to St. Anne to save him, and then he pledges himself to the life of, 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 of a monk of my pastorism, hmm. if she saves him, which obviously happens because now he gets off to the nearest <laughs> monastery. Yeah. Is that Augustinian one good for him that it's an Augustinian one? Yeah. So these events forced the seniors by the student to contemplate death and the consequences of a misfit life. And here's now the interesting thing. And this is how his theology starts. According to the Roman Catholic dogma, the way of salvation was the way of the seven sacraments and good works. And one of them, of the sacraments, was celibacy. Now you would be excluded, obviously, uh, if, if, if you believe that you were able to handle the celibacy, you would be excluded from that one particular sacrament of the marriage vow. Hmm. Uh, even during this time, everyone knows that the shortest way to heaven was provided by monastics. Thomas Aquinas says it this way, monastic vows was to experience a second baptism, which would restore one to the sinless state he experienced after his first baptism. So, the, you, you'll see that the theology is based on experience here. Yeah? It's, it's fully experiential. There's no word given to explain it all. This is purely experience. Yeah, well, it's funny how we're moving into the same constant, same ridiculousness at the moment. This it's all why, experiential. Yes, this is what I'm saying. If you track history, you will find that we did the yeah. same things yeah. years ago. Yeah. Um, repentance for sins committed after becoming a monk, restored the baptismal experience, innocence again and again. So it was not that I was made righteous because Christ clothed me with his righteousness. <laughs> well, I experienced it somehow. <laughs> you know, positionally, uh, I, I was innocent before God. Um, in any case, the rewards of the monastic life were not only future, they would have ample opportunity to cultivate the spiritual side of life. Prayer and studies, each monastery had a library. But those were the seeds, prayer and study. Those were good seeds that were sown into his life, in, in this monastic life. In addition, the Augustinian order which Luther entered stressed Bible study. They even allowed to pursue, at least some of them were allowed to pursue degrees in universities because some of them were expected to supply teachers to the universities. Mm. So now you've got Christians teaching at the universities, the first universities. Mm. Devout and studious uh, Luther, the emphasis on, on Bible study made his choice <coughs> an easy one. This is why he entered where he entered. Luther followed the prescribed life of the monastery with such an earnestness that he put many a monk to shame. So from a very early age he showed an inclination mm. to the righteous life. Mm. Um, not that he fully understood how to attain that righteousness. Yeah. 
but he grasped that yes. and there was yeah, that yeah, yeah. this is this desire yes this is desire you want to live a righteous life yes what they did this in may 1507 is there's still doubts in, in his heart in spite of everything he persisted he fasted sometimes for three days, regularly exceeding the canonical seven times a day prayer rule, deprived himself of blankets and nearly froze to death. Good grief. No, this apparently All he was a pain righteousness. Right, apparently this yeah, guy so, went to the next level. Yeah, next level. All <laughs> the pain righteousness. <laughs> then you had the auricular confession, which was to prove particularly frustrating to Brother Martin. And the rule was very simple. One had to remember all your sins in order to make a complete confession. And poor Luther had a problem trying to remember all his sins. So often he would um, go and do that, and then he walked away, and then he came back running right to his vicar or whatever, his overseer, yeah. and said, I forgot a few, let me start again. He mentioned that chase the for me. Um, yes, that's right, I heard that story, yeah. He spent agonizing hours in confession trying to remember them all. However, Luther's problem was something other than pre preoccupation of trivialities. Here was yeah. a young monk who had not found the forgiveness he sought or the presence of a gracious God, and furthermore, he would not be satisfied with the substitute either. In fact, he hated God. But his was a caricature which the Middle Ages had created. Egotistical, vengeful, man was an item for entertainment, it seems. Well, that's my line, not uh, the writer's line. <laughs> because that is how he received God. And I think often in our in our walk, in our witness, that is what must sometimes be corrected, because somebody has an idea of God. And that is what you call, that is what you sometimes speak to in somebody's life. Yeah. Even in counseling I find that sometimes that there needs to be just a slight correction of the theology. And when that happens and it's grasped, poof. It's a light bulb that goes on. Yeah. God does the rest. I don't have to do anything. No. Um, yeah. In fifteen ten, Luther and another from Erfurt, the Erfurt cloister, has chosen to address the dispute with the Augustinian order before the Pope, and he is looking forward to this opportunity, obviously, because there's um, there's lots of time to avail himself of all the spiritual benefits of a religious pilgrimage. So he visits the relics and, more specifically, Pilate's holy steps. Now, these holy steps was apparently. Um, these steps were transported from Jerusalem or wherever and brought them and put them. So what he did was he had his view of these steps. It was overwhelming. And on each step he went down to uh, confess and do the pattern of the or the our father. And then he would kiss the step and go up this flight of steps. And eventually he got to the top and he looked. And he said to himself, these steps is possibly not 1,500 years old, but maybe 200 years old. <laughs> that was his first observation. And besides the relics, he noticed how the, the, the papacy were like living in luxury, hmm. how ignorant, frivolous, and immoral the Italian priests were. And this left him delusioned, disillusioned. When he entered Rome, he, he exclaimed, Rome thrice holy from the blood of the martyrs. When he left, he said, I went with onions and I left with garlic. <laughs> no, I mean, he, he's trying very hard to, to, to live this righteous life because that's according to their teachings. But yet these guys, somewhere along the line, it's going to... It's, 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 it's unbelievable. It's going to snap. Um, because he has a desire in his heart and he doesn't see that desire in theirs. In theirs. Yeah, that's a problem. So in Wittenberg, the rule of feeling the wise, uh, there's a movie, there's actually a movie in Luther. For the cloth, Luther receives his licentiate, this is just prior to his doctorate in, on October 19th at the University of Wittenberg, on August 1. Now it seems that in that same month, it's possibly that he started lecturing already, but what we do know is that August 1, 1530, he commenced lecturing on the Psalms. Full of 15 beginners lectures on the Romans, during his intensive studies of the Epistle of Paul, that Luther was at last to find the gracious God. Now, here starts his problem. Mm. The way had been pointed out by his spiritual guide, Stockings already. But it was Romans 1 17 that opened for him the gates of paradise. For Paul reads, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed 
from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteousness, the righteous shall live by no, faith. faith. Yes. The problem with Luther is, is how he reads this particular passage. We'll get to that now. now. Pilgrimage reaches a climax at Wittenberg, and here he lectures twice a week. He's also got other responsibilities with the Augustinian stall. He preaches regularly in the castle church, which is the church of French the Wise. Now, outwardly, he's doing just brilliantly still. Inwardly, this man is still in turmoil because he still doesn't grasp it. Yeah. Luther's own words are revealing when he says, In the monastery I did not think about women or gold or goods, but my heart trembled and doubted how God could be gracious to me. Then I fell from faith and permitted myself to think that I come under the wrath of God, whom I must reconcile with my good works. And there was the problem. He thought he could do it. My good works. Not by grace through faith. Mm. Not by his own doing, so that he wouldn't boast. He didn't understand it fully. <clears throat> it was with such a fear of the God and wrath that Luther approached the Psalms and later Romans. So he persists in connecting Romans 1, 17 with verse 18. The problem is he reads the Greek wrong. And eventually when he reads it correctly, he understands that 17 and 16 goes together. And not 17 and 18 because 18 introduces a new section. The verses 1 to 7 is what we call um, a, a, a story on its own or a, a theme on its own. Verse 18 introduces a second theme. That's in chapter? One. One, yes. yes. Introduces a second theme. Yes. Because if you read verse 16, Yeah, from, because from verse 18 is where the wrath and the wrath of God is revealed yeah. against all. And Paul yeah, starts yeah. explaining from verse 18, he explains where, where sin comes from. Yes, that's right. Because if he goes back to 16, <coughs> he will begin to understand, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, gospel. which is the power of God for salvation to everyone yes. who believes. So not only does he discover forgiveness when he under, begins to understand that, he also understands now that there's a gospel to proclaim. Yes. That's when he starts getting it right. Yeah. He persisted in connecting Romans 7 and verse 18. This way God appeared to show his righteousness in exercising his wrath against the sinner. Even though the climate of Luther's day was with its emphasis upon an angry God influenced Luther to understand God's justice in this way. He was not satisfied with this interpretation. That's why you have what we call sometimes black theology or you have the charismat in excess, hmm. oh, because that is the that is the somebody might grow up in that hmm. from birth, hmm. so they understand nothing else because that is their world or their context until they withdraw themselves and maybe come amongst others who think differently or understand the scriptures differently, and now they compare apples with apples. And you find the ones arguing with one another are always the two extremes. Yes. Arguing over the, the middle. But you see, a lot of times we don't extract ourselves from our positions hmm. to be able to see it. Like I said to the one Muslim, I grew up in a Christian home, you grew up in a Muslim home. Now, I wasn't a Christian from day one, but you were a Muslim from day okay. one. Because that is what you were taught. Um, but, but I also understand that to some degree we were um, indoctrinated, and I use that word. Hmm. Um, deliberately, hmm. that you were indoctrinated in one sense and I was indoctrinated in, in, in yeah, another in sense. sense. Yeah. But at a certain age, I was told you must now make up your own mind. You weren't given that choice. Mm. In other words, you weren't given the choice to investigate your own faith. Mm. No, so you were never told to stand back and say, Is this true? Mm. Well, I was told this thing can be measured. Yeah. You can go and test it. Yeah. You weren't taught that. No. So you've got nothing to compare yours against each other. In fact, you won't, you're not encouraged to do that. No. Where the Bible encourages you to test. I actually told my a friend, a friend of mine who's very scientifically inclined, although he believes in the creed.
That's how they feel about another side there. So, and that's why history is so important. Once you have the context of the thing, you can then look into it, reason it out. Um, our, 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 what we take from the stories might still be very different, but at least we can work with the same context and then argue it out. So, later Luther related experience that free him from such misunderstanding is a long quote there, but I'm going to look at that next week um, when we look a little bit at his. Um, His theology. So at last he comes to some understanding, okay, because he understands that the verses does not belong together. Hmm. Um, like I said, he not only found forgiveness, he also found the gospel to proclaim, which was rooted and grounded in hmm. the act of redemption. Because on the cross, Christ died for the sin against sins, whether remembered or not, were forgiven to the repentant and believing sinner. Christ, the austere judge, was replaced by Christ who loved us and gave himself to us. So finally he begins to understand love and justice. The God of the thunderstorm took his rightful place as our heavenly Father who knows our weakness and who in his unfathomable love gave his only Son for our redemption. The Virgin Mary, still highly esteemed, was no longer the object of worship or the mediatrix between God and man. At last Christ had come into his own and Luther found his gracious God through faith in him. The long search was over and the Reformation had begun. And here's your task for next week. Okay.